So we have one uh, participant from, uh, from remote, that will be one of our speakers. But before I start listening, because she had listened a lot, the idea is to, that we play a game together. Huh? So, but I will be sensible to you. So I will not ask you all to stand, to go there. I will just ask to take uh, one card per color and then to pass the card on. So one green, one red, one yellow. Maybe we can sweep, do two packages. And then we will play a game. Very simple. Uh, it's called Spectrogram. How many of you had pay, played the Spectrogram in your life? No one. Okay, that's better. So Spectrogram is very simple. It's a game, one color each. Yes, yes, you have to have all three colors. Yes, also the red. If you want to split the card so that people can just take and pass on. Meanwhile, I will explain. So the spectrum is very simple. I will read a sentence, a statement, and you will decide if you agree, disagree, or you really don't think you have an opinion. Hmm? If you agree, you will raise your green card. If you disagree, you will raise your red card. If you don't have a strong opinion, you will just keep the yellow orange with you. And then we will uh, listen to the people that think red, the people that think green, the people that think orange. Hmm? Very simple. Hi, Liliana. Sorry, I don't have card for you, but if you want, you can write on, uh, on a little paper, red, the green, uh, and uh, orange, and you can play too. Huh? You want to say some words about the overall panel while the card are distributed? No, no, let's wait. Um, yes. So have faith. Okay, we can run a test. I can ask for three volunteers here. Can I have three volunteers that have already the card? Just come. One, two, another person that has the card. Arvi, yes, we'll do the volunteering. So now we'll do a test, a demo. And please think differently, the three of you. So I will read Because <laughs> the demo, it's always a patch, you know? OK, so I will read the simple sentence. And you will decide, agree, disagree, no strong opinion. Uh, the sentence is, privacy. If you don't sit at the table, you are on the menu. If you are not sitting on the table, you If you are not sitting, yes, you are on the menu. So OK, so then I will ask. Yes. Tick, 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 I need to see. So I go to Arvin and say, why you think, why you disagree? Because I don't think like that. Why? Elaborate. No, I'm, it's not the way how it's done. That's why. But you will be more, more collaborative. He is just uh, holding back. Yeah. yeah. Why you are so, in the middle? Because I don't have a strong opinion on this. I couldn't understand the message that much, so I prefer just being neutral. Why you are strongly agreeing with the sentence? Because I believe in active participation in anything. Okay, so clear? <laughs> there is not a right or wrong answer. It's just uh, to have a sense of what you think about issues and themes that then we are going to unpack more. And if you like that, before ending, you can just, uh, during the session, write your own statement. If you want to try with the, with the audience, then we can try also some of your own statement. So, thank you, my test, my demo, for the trust. Okay, so I hope that now everyone has the card. And please, once that you have made up your mind, if you can keep your uh, hand raised so that I can see who is red, who is green, who is yellow. Okay, so first, uh, first sentence. 
Privacy by default is a utopia in big data era. Okay, so I will start. There is a red over there at the end. The blonde woman over there. Yes, yes, I saw your red card. Laura, stand up. Yes, you had the red card, don't hide. <laughs> so why you think? I think that, that privacy can be saved in the big data, in big data era, so I don't truly think that privacy can be compromised. Thank you, where are the green card? Green card, green card, do you want to make me running? So I go here. Shall we listen to this green card? Thanks. Um, I think that as soon as we accept the fact that uh, privacy is something that is, first of all, very softly defined and is, is impossible, then we will um, pave the way towards increasing the trust towards uh, all of the stakeholders involved in the data management process. Because I think that uh, having the opinion that privacy uh, by all means can be preserved, then a loss of trust is very uh, easy to come into play. And I think trust is what uh, glues all the components in one society together. It's important for democracy, for everything to function. So, Thank you. What are my yellow undecided people? So who was undecided? Don't be shy. Can't believe a world of shy people that want to change the world. <laughs> okay, I go to the next. Uh, companies should compensate users for using their data. Disagree red, agree green, I don't know what, yellow. I know that there are more cards in the room, so don't be shy. Okay, let's go to the green to see why agree. I saw very happy agreeing. Yeah, definitely a better model should be, should be done in the digital economy so that uh, if uh, big companies use uh, users' data to uh, market uh, their uh, services, that they should be compensated somehow. So Facebook is, for instance, when you see that uh, uh, this, this friend uh, of yours likes a certain page, then and Google and Facebook is showing you that actually you 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 should your if your name is mentioned uh, to market this page to uh, to your friend, then uh, there should be a model in which you would benefit somehow. Like we can open a pension fund for activists in this way, because <laughs> usually we end our life miserably. Anyway, so where are the red, the one that disagree? Uh, I know that there were more red. Okay, I will go with this red and then you stay yellow, because you had both. Okay, then we will listen. Yeah, I think maybe I lean more towards, I guess, both, but it's, I think it depends on whether this, you are already paying to use the service. The thing with Facebook is it's free, so I kind of think, well, this is me paying for it, they use my data, I don't pay for Facebook. So I guess it may be different if you're already paying to use a, a company, but. Thank you, thank you back. <laughs> listen to you. Um, I totally agree with the girl talking before me, um, but I would like to state something, well, if you, if you buy a car that collects your data and the producer of the car is the owner of the data which I created with driving the car and buying the car, then I think this sh that, that there should be some compensation between, between us. But on the other side, of course, with the services, there is nothing like a free lunch. That it was told to me years ago. So I agree. When it's free for use, you ha you have to compensate it. But if you pay for it, then they shouldn't uh, uh, use your trust of using their services, even though you're paid, or especially if you paid for the service. Okay. Thank you. Another statement. And then we can move to the depth of the conversation. So the last one, the real problem with big data is anonymization, not privacy. Agree, disagree. You know that they say that when they harvest all this data, they can just make you anonymous so that no one can link 
what had been harvested to you. So, I read again. The real problem with big data is anonymization, not privacy. Okay, who oh. oh, feel? Okay, there are a lot of yellow card. Okay, let's listen. One yellow, and I know, stay green. Uh, uh, can you read the question again? The real problem with big data is, is anonymization versus privacy. privacy. Uh, anonymization can actually be done, but privacy, it's a bigger, bigger endeavor. So it's, um, it can be on that level, but it hasn't. So far, we will see, uh, does it move in that direction, but it can be, it can be like a better, better Are there yellow cars that want to express their opinion? No? Then I go to my only green. Thank you. Yeah, I agree that that's true due to the fact that um, <clears throat> anonymization is a huge problem. Also, we call it synthetization synthetization or something like that, or minimization as well. Um, it's a huge problem, in fact, and however, most of, the, most of the tackling problem here is, first of all, with the GDPR as well, and then also with many other regulations, uh, and especially comes up the problem with um, um, cloud as well, due to the fact that sometimes um, you have either private cloud or you have hybrid cloud or you have cloud as a service, so it's somewhere else, it's not in your premises and therefore your data has to be synthesized or minimized or encrypted or whatsoever. The question of uh, is it a problem between privacy and so on, it is a huge problem but then on the other hand the biggest problem is synthesization due to the fact that organizations don't know how to do it, and they don't know how to deal with it and <clears throat> this comes to a problem where they think if they put it into a somewhere or their own computers or their own services or servers, they think, oh, I don't have to do it. I don't have to synthesize it. I don't have to anonymize it, anonymize it and so on. But then on the other hand comes whatever can, whatever can link to you or to anyone or can ping to someone, then that is a privacy issue. Thank you. So do we have time for one more? Yeah? Okay. So, but then please make your own showing. Okay. The enormous value for the global economy, innovation, and productivity is more valuable than personal interest. You're talking about that. I read again. The enormous value for the global economy, economic innovation, and productivity of big data or click economy is more valuable than personal interest. Hmm? One green, one yellow. You really don't believe in anything related to that, huh? Okay, let's go to some red here. You'd been active. Did you have the red? Yeah. You're green. What the? Oh, great, stay green. I go to the red here. Well, thanks. I showed red because I think there should be a balance always. We should not compromise on one side. Well, I think it depends on the on the data. For example, if I'm if I have a loan from a bank, I think it's uh, for me it, it might be very important for the bank not to go bankrupt. Then you know, or if I have a credit for a bank or something like that, then so my personal interest it's secondary in a way. That's why. Any undecided? Yes. Yeah, because I think that there, uh, there is a shared responsibility between what's collective good and what's uh, individual good. Sometimes individual good <coughs> is necessary for collective good to emerge, but sometimes that's not the case. So that's why. Okay, thank you for your collaboration and for having here and there raised your hand and also for not having raised your hand. I'll let you continue. I think this is working. You're very welcome to join us because we feel a bit lonely here. <laughs> no, okay. Anyway, 
Um, hello, uh, good morning again. Um, I, don't, I don't think I need to in actually introduce what the panel is about because actually I think uh, you, you have all, uh, with the questions of, of Vale and, uh, and uh, your answers, uh, you have all set the scene on pretty much what we actually would like to address. So um, to the f in formal introduction, everybody knows uh, Valentina Pelitzer, of course, uh, from the Association for Progressive Communications, Borgia and Zegovina, that just introduced. Um, on um, my left, I have uh, Janet Sarajeva from Vivacom Bulgaria. She will uh, give us the perspective of the business. Um, then we have uh, online, we have Liliana pekov from the Metamorphosis Foundation for the Internet Society um, from uh, Macedonia. Hello, Liliana. Um, we will have a bit of a delay uh, with Liliana so that uh, uh, the communications work well, but uh, we keep uh, on relying on our technical <laughs> support uh, there. Um, uh, so then we have uh, Nicoletta as our online, online moderator, uh, and Nika and Yana will be our rapporteurs. Thank you very much for your support as well, which is essential to the session. Myself, I'm uh, Marta Capello from the European Telecom Network Operators, and I have Christina uh, Olausen, also from the same association. Christina is actually with uh, Valentina, one of the brains behind the preparation of the session. So, introductions made. Um, I would uh, then uh, go to our panelists, uh, Janet and Liliana. Maybe, Janet, you can start. We'll make a short introduction to give us the business uh, perspective. Then Liliana will follow with the perspective from the civil society. Could I change here? Okay, uh, well, Liliana, I don't know if you heard from the floor, uh, the technical experts say that it's better that you go first, so would you like to start with your presentation? Yes, uh, good afternoon to all, and best regards to my colleagues here. Um, I wanted to start uh, replying to the questions that Dushan actually posted previously about the content of the women's bag, perhaps, and whether we are alone in the universe. So basically, what I think is that um, the aliens brought us this GDPR. Uh, the GDPR is not seen as a regulation, but a revolution, mostly. So um, GDPR, as seen, is, is a process. It's not an only uh, uh, seen as a red button that you can press and from now on, like from the 25th of May, you're, you can actually implement what's, uh, everything in the GDPR. Uh, GDPR is a process, is a revolution that uh, is basically made upon statements and upon uh, assessments. So if you want to, to talk about the GDPR, it's equally as the question or the reply to the question, what is the content of the woman's back? It's basically that complex and that, that contextual. It depends when you're going, where are you going, and which bag do you want to, to take with you on the evening. Um, the GDPR, uh, we first have to introduce, um, and we have to agree upon what we're discussing about the GDPR, whether we're discussing GDPR actually in Europe or in the USA. Why? Because uh, data protection is equal to a privacy assurance and the privacy of the information in the USA. So basically, um, the privacy of the information is seeing all the security measures that are actually needed to happen, to, to be undertaken as seen from the USA terminology. But what we are speaking in Europe as the GDPR is implied to European data subjects and European citizens as well. Uh, no matter on the geographically uh, where they are, is what is encompassing not only the security measures, uh, but also the data privacy regimes. So basically, what we have seen in the previous couple of weeks is um, not only the, the first words of uh, the GDPR implementation uh, that is um, coming as from tomorrow, but actually the e-privacy directive and, of course, the modernization of Convention 108 from the uh, Council of Europe. So basically what we have now is enriched and very broad data protection regime. But as from now on, as from tomorrow, I think that we should not speak much more about data protection, 
but as for the protection of and the privacy of the data that we are collecting and sending. Um, what are the new uh, challenges that the GDPR is um, bringing us? For the time being, it is very clear that nothing is clear. <laughs> so basically, the GDPR is involving the, the entire life cycle of um, bringing the data into the digital economy, which means that uh, from the start of the processing of uh, the, the personal data, even uh, as the remote access is being seen uh, as a processing of personal data. So basically, um, what the greatest challenge and what the greatest, um, let's say, a benefit from the GDPR I see is that this data breach notification issue. So, for example, when you have a data breach um, in a cryptic data, then you don't have the obligation to inform the data subject about the breach. But except if uh, this is not encrypted data, then you must um, ensure and uh, notify the data subject about what happened, why it happened, and what are the risks for possible even further um, data protection violations. So basically what emerges here is that the GDPR is raising the level of encryption and the necessity of encryption of data, which perhaps um, is not only strengthening the, this regime, but uh, actually uh, what is the GDPR mostly of, and that is basically to improve data subject rights. Uh, the GDPR has started as uh, improving the data subject rights and information and notification about it. So we should all think in, in that possible way. What are the technical and organizational measures that need to be implied when you have different data sets basically combined uh, and delivered to third parties? Um, so I would um, very much would like to, to speak, you asked me basically to speak about the civil society aspect in all of this um, surrounding of GDPR. Mostly I would refer firstly to the uh, preparedness of the institutions, preparedness of the data protection agencies, uh, not only Europe but uh, specifically in the Southeast uh, region. Um, what they have done, uh, what are they doing, are they increasing the level of the resources the material, the human resources basically that we need uh, for as a basic level, as a platform that we we, we need them um, as a backup as well to tell us how to do it, what, what we need to do. And what the civil society aspect could bring more is definitely to capacity building and raising the awareness uh, towards the citizens uh, as a data subject's rights. Um, what we need in the region specifically is to discuss more of the challenges that we have um, as an experience from the EU countries. Basically, the GDPR as a regulation, it was said that as a regulation it will imply to all countries um, as the same. But nevertheless, as we see in the previous months, uh, basically different EU countries is differently interpreting some of the provisions uh, in the GDPR. For example, as, as far as for the children rights, for example, Austria has decreased the age uh, number of uh, to 13, uh, where the data protection regime applies from the GDPR, so as Finland, so as other EU countries. So why different provisions from the GDPR now are interpreting and stated in the uh, different national EU countries? implementation. So what are we doing in the Southeast region? Uh, how our um, data protection acts are going to be harmonized with the GDPR? Where do we see our challenges? So basically those are the questions I would refer to the regulators in our countries. And most of it, um, the civil society sector could bring more into the raising of awareness about the, the small businesses um, and the and the small um, uh, ent enterprises. Because I'm not so worried about the big uh, companies so they are referring to the EU processes and EU regulations so from the previous even 9546 directive. But I'm mostly worried about 
uh, the small the SMEs actually how they're going to implement it, whether do they have enough resources and knowledge to implement it, and basically to answer the question what we have discussed previously with the organizers of CDK is whether GDPR is going to affect and impact the digital economy. It sure will. Uh, the digital, not only the digital economy and how we do business actually is um, most of it with whom we are doing business. Uh, so basically, if we are sure that this um, SME or this company or this organization is implying enough assurance of the protection regime inside, then you know um, assured of starting a collaboration more. So it will imply not only the, the digital economy, but it will imply also to other sectors. Uh, as um, I was a participant in this global security forum a couple of days in Bratislava, the Globsec, they were mostly discussing about the GDPR, not cyber security, but cyber sustainability, when we are implying the GDPR in the privacy regime. So um, what we are looking for is basically a strong, um, process inside and strong knowledge, not only the data protection officer, but mostly of the all uh, employees within the organization to be aware uh, about the data protection uh, procedures, the data protection toolkit, and uh, basically the skill they need to have in order to work with our personal data. Everyone has personal data, and the basic um, challenge is that uh, the GDPR is introducing three types of, of data, not only the personal data, as was uh, in the, the previous uh, directive 95.6. Basically, we have personal data, we have now anonymous data that are not personal data, and we have pseudonymous uh, data, which are actually the encrypted data, so different kinds of organizational and technical measures should be implied depending on the level of, um, depending on the type of uh, data you're using, you are processing, and depending on all other uh, contextualized questions, whether you have the reasons to keep it enough, what, what are the basic um, uh, goals or legal norms that you need to have these data and basically what kind of information and when actually you need to inform the data subject rights, the data subject about his rights to be um, informed and uh, the rights to be uh, actually consented about the procession um, of data. So um, what I wanted to, uh, to finish this with is that the GDPR is um, a process that actually encounters much more with the transparency and accountability. So these are the principles that we need to uh, take into account when we are um, affecting the, the GDPR in an organization. For example, I've been working with a couple of SMEs from different sectors, uh, from education and from health sector. And this is, uh, the health sector is basically um, two employees working as a, in a cardio, private cardio clinic, uh, the doctor and you know the medical person, and basically uh, it's not uh, even more important now about the number of employees, whether there are less than ten people, but actually the the collectiveness, the the, the numbers of categories of personal data involved, especially the sensitive data, are involved into the the processing uh, part. Um, so, uh, it is a process, as I said, it's not a red button and from tomorrow, yes, we are implementing the GDPR from now on, what that means. It means a lot of more questions and assessments and privacy input assessments done in, in the process. And basically, what we need uh, CDIC for now as a platform, uh, it's good that we have a multi-stakeholder approach here in the region and we can all discuss on together to map the challenges what we are uh, doing together. Um, so digital economy is affected by the GDPR and the GDPR is a global voice. It's basically set an alien uh, voice over 
not only Europe, but elsewhere as well. And I would finish now with one very good sentence, basically, from my colleague Dusan Stoichevic, who said a couple of days ago, there is no better PR than the GDPR. If there are any questions, I'm here to answer them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Liliana, for, for your uh, very comprehensive uh, presentation and also for giving us like so much insight and raising the uh, issues that are brought with the concrete uh, application with the, with the GDPR. We hope to come back to some of these issues. Let's uh, now hear the perspective of the business uh, from uh, Yena Tarejev from Vivacom, Bulgaria. Thank you. I will need to uh, like help here with the presentation. Meanwhile, let me introduce myself. I'm Janet Zaharieva, and I'm working uh, as a chief advisor to the managing board of Vivacom. Vivacom is uh, the Bulgarian incumbent operator. Which presentation? Uh, I, I will do without my glasses. Should be CED Janet Zaharieva. This one but should start from the beginning. Yes, thank you very much. It was very interesting to me to follow the spectrogram that you have organized because it gives a very, very pragmatic approach of all of us what we believe the privacy of data is. Uh, that's why I would like to speak with my very short presentation about an optimistic story uh, on data protection. Uh, first of all, let me very shortly introduce Vivacom. Uh, as I said, this is the incumbent operator. We provide all variety of services, fixed telephone services, fixed internet, mobile voice and mobile internet, as well as TV services and online services. Uh, and every day we are servicing more than 4 million customers, which means that every day we are collecting or processing uh, their data. And it, GDPR is, and data protection is very, very important for us. Uh, of course, GDPR and data protection, I mean, data protection does not start from tomorrow when the GDPR becomes effective. Data protection, we are doing all, already for many years, and the main pillars of data protection, like uh, transparency and accountability, uh, have been in implicit obligation already in the old directive. This means that we've been obliged to report for any uh, processing uh, to our data protection authority, uh, and actually for those years, we've made uh, very good relations with the data protection authority in Bulgaria, uh, besides reporting and being audited by the regulator, we've made also many campaigns uh, with the regulator trying to create awareness of data protection uh, and to create, I loved very much this uh, perception of uh, cybersecurity culture and my, I made tip of this in saying that we try to create a, a personal data protection culture as well. Uh, so here I will add to what Liliana said that GDPR is a revolution, I will rather see it as an evolution in data protection in a digital environment. So, <clears throat> for us, we are seeing GDPR as an opportunity. Uh, because telecom market, you know, is a very, very competitive market. We are striving uh, to get customers, we are fighting and competing for customers every day. Not only to get them, but also to retain them. Uh, that's why for us, GDPR is an instrument to enhance the trust of the consumers. Most of you, when speaking about the data protection, speaks also about trust. Uh, for us, GDPR is a tool and instrument that might distinguish somehow the legitimate players the responsible players that they make uh, responsible data, protect, uh, data protection processing uh, from the other players. We are seeing it as a quality stamp that will distinguish the good 
legitimate business from the business that's, that does not care about uh, the privacy data of their consumers. Uh, that's why in Vivacom we had put a lot of human and financial efforts already for one year to prepare ourselves uh, and to upgrade our procedures to be uh, online with the requirement of GDPR. So first of all, we've made a gap assessment of our procedures and practices so as to see whether we need to do something else. Uh, then we've made um, uh, impact assessment. Uh, and of course, this instrument serves us to make a risk management assessment and also to improve our procedures so as to minimize uh, the risk for data leakage or unlawful processing of data of our consumers. Uh, we, did, did, uh, we did this by our own efforts and also using the services and help of consultants like Deloitte and specially specialized uh, internet company that are dealing with um, uh, specific IT procedures uh, in GDPR implementation. Of course, we did a lot trainings for the personnel uh, that is dealing uh, with the personal, uh, with processing of personal data, because this is very important for them to have a sensitivity that they are dealing with a very sensitive data. Uh, and last but not least, because Mr. Boni spoke about this, uh, what will be the uh, what will be the next step for the industry? Uh, we we plan to make also voluntary certification procedure for ourselves, so as to have third-party audit uh, that our system are, uh, are, de uh, are dealing okay with the GDPR requirements. So this bouquet of all actions that we have made with our own efforts, with the consultants, uh, and finally with the voluntary certification, we believe that will give a confidence to our customers to stay with us or to come to use our services. So probably many of you know this mythical, awful creature. Do you know who she is? Medusa, yeah, I agree with you. Medusa is threatening, but do you read her very, very sad story? Because she used to be a very nice, blonde hair maiden, uh, priestess to the goddess Athena, uh, vote for virginity. But one day she fell in love with Poseidon and of course losing her virginity, she was punished and become this awful creature when her blonde hair became to uh, poisonous steak, snakes. I put her ugly face here just uh, uh, to warn that the law of uh, European legislator and policy maker to make some specific policies, sector-specific policies, conservative interpretation, may turn us to stone, as the Medusa did to anyone who looked at her. So we plead, and that's why we're talking a lot about the GDPR as a horizontal instrument for data protection for all industry. And because we believe the telecom industry and our networks are the backbone for digitalization of the entire economy, so we believe that uh, the draft uh, legislation that is prepared now by uh, European Parliament on specific sector-specific legislation on data protection in the telecom sector uh, is absolutely not necessary and may cause a lot of troubles not only to our sector but for all the industry in a digital economy. Better to look at the data protection is an opportunity. This is our view on this. Uh, <clears throat> we believe that legitimate data pro uh, processing may give us a lot of new opportunities, like to make tailor-made services for our retail customers, for example, by profiling group of people. Uh, we also, because many of you mentioned, especially Liliana probably, what will be the problem for small and medium-sized enterprises to implement GDPR? So for these customers of our corporate customers, we are uh, ready to provide them GDPR-ready products uh, so as to uh, implement this in their system and to be ready to face uh, 
the day of tomorrow. Agree here with Liliana that GDPR implementation will not be an overnight process. This will be work on process day after day. Uh, and we believe that really it provides opportunities uh, and that the legitimate data processing is win-to-win -win situation either for the companies and also uh, for the consumers. And at the end, I believe that if we do it well, this will help us by trust, by not having uh, conservative uh, legi uh, le uh, legislative packages. This will help us to grow a digital uh, data-driven economy because we cannot do, for example, smart cities uh, without processing data. Uh, we cannot do some augmented reality in the business without processing personal data. Uh, that's why uh, I'll, I will finish with this. Let's look at the GDPR as a tool, as an instrument that will give us very much new opportunities. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Yes, please. Maybe we can have Liliana back on the screen. Then we can. Hi, Liliana, can you hear us? We can see you again. Okay, so um, you, you both raised uh, many, many interesting issues and I would like to come back to, to a couple of them. Um, so basically we are really in this data-driven economy and you just finished the, the use of data for, for businesses and, and services providers in general is, is actually very important for innovation to come up with new services that are in the interest of the population, but also for businesses to, to thrive and to actually have a, gr a, a growth in, in the economy of the, 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 the European countries, of course. Um, the, the, the issue is then how we do balance this with the concerns that were raised at the beginning by our, by our audience on the creation of trust in this uh, digital ecosystem. How can people rely on these services and uh, provide their data to these services and, 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 um, and uh, rely on the fact that they are treated in a responsible manner? And um, there are two particularly two new rights that the GDPR creates, and we have not spoken yet, that I would like to, to ask your views on those, which is the, the data portability. So when you provide your data to a platform, then you have the right to have it back or transferred to another service provider, uh, although the way this is going to be done is still not, not very clear. And there's also the right to be forgotten, so that you can actually ask for for um, for uh, to, to your service provider or someone that used your data and published something about you to eliminate all the records about about uh, about the person invo involved, Liliana, would you like to comment a bit the, these topics? Um, yes, I would um, very much like to, to refer the trust and accountability and transparency data to basically what uh, what we all acknowledge is that. The principles of accountability and transparency went down when implementing the requirements, the data privacy requirements, within the organization will come up and sure with uh, end up with the trust of the customer being uh, collaborating with the organization. So basically, I would refer to the previous speaker and thank thank him for the uh, you know bringing trust. A customer um, as a client of the organization. For example, if I know that. As SME or any organization is implying or uh, implementing a good privacy policies within the, um, the the services they are offering, then I'm sure that my privacy is protected. Uh, basically, it's not the privacy as itself, but the privacy of the data of my data that I'm collecting. That is why we're not speaking. I would love not to speak more about you know the, the personal data protection regime. But basically, what the product is, um, we're definitely a product on the menu. We're not the product uh, sitting, we're not the person sitting on the audience, but we are product on the menu. Wherever you are collecting uh, any kind of data, that's why I mentioned previously, it's not the personal data anymore, just a category, but uh, anonymous data, which are not personal data, as you see. 
are also sets of data that could be combined and again that could raise the question of my privacy my behavior as a client my behavior as a customer when I buy strictly the same product each and every month each and every day for example if I go to a supermarket in I and if I buy the same cheese every day then that's a behavioral that could you know imply the privacy of a customer but if I know that this this organization or this control of let's use terminology of the data protection regulation if this controller is implying a good technical not only technical and IT security measures but as well organizational measures within then my trust as a customer being there would raise the issue of you know the way we work the way we collaborate more together so basically the southeast region or companies and businesses should refer more to sell it was good said before this is a tool a mechanism to ensure the customers that they are doing the right thing they are doing the things on the right manner so it's not only a you know it's a process of constantly revising how you are collecting and processing and storing and then erasing the personal data or the data sets not only the personal data because you can erase the personal data you have collected and you can inform what you have mentioned previously the data subject rights that you have erased my personal data but again you have assured or you have basically perhaps in some point decided to use the data not my personal data as a customer as a you know holder of I don't know one card of 15% discount in this digital you know online shopping let's say but as a customer you have decided to use my data that one customer from Macedonia is using this type of chain so again we are not as a you know retailers or as a company that sells cheese we're not very much interested in you know distributing this kind of service there because there is only one person that is using this type of product so basically what we're speaking is not only erasing the personal data but the data sets or the data that are not actually explaining to or referring to a natural person to identify the natural person as it was previously in the directive 9546 but as well the data that are explaining the behavior of one customer so this changes a lot in the business game and this is what the implication is basically most you know talked about because it's not only the erasure of data what they're collecting but again the notification and if I want to withdraw my personal data my data sets from your company then what are the technical possibilities that you have that you need also to tell me or give me my personal data will give me online will you distribute me to or through a mail well will you you know copy it on a CD and you know send me over post office I mean those are you know very specific and technical issues that we need to discuss more and we need to raise the issue among the businesses in the region because if we want a sure and we assured you know privacy based and assured let's say safeguarded privacy within the region and if we want to safeguard also our businesses in the region then we need to work out together and to sell this as a good tool as a mechanism for the businesses in the Europe and the USA as well so thank you yes again I would refer not only to that that is why I mentioned that the previous to understand the terminology we are using the businesses need to know when to understand that the USA companies are using only the security the security measures which refers to the privacy information part and that is the data protection for them 
But again, for uh, Europe-based companies, uh, there are two things that we need to remember. That is the data privacy requirements, so the privacy of the data that are collected, no matter of the, the category of personal data we are speaking about, and again, the information security requirements. So there are two levels um, of uh, ensuring that we are doing the right uh, thing as ensuring the data subject rights or let's say that our potential consumers. Um, Th I would also refer that um, if you, GDPR is, uh, you know, it's a very broad and it's a very, um, it's a discussion prior implementation. I would agree it's not only a revolution, but it's, it is an evolution, yes, but it's mostly an evolution in our mindset because what have we worked so far, the way we worked so far, now is a, you know, it's a game-changing uh, procedure within organization, no matter of the, the number of the, the, the employees. And one, one thing again, I would uh, agree with uh, the previous speaker, um, it was mentioned that we need like uh, sector-based policies uh, and assurances. Um, even within, uh, you know, the specific sector, for example, in education sector, security sector, surveillance sector as well. I mean, it is influencing the, um, the technical measures that are used in surveillance as well. So imagine uh, assuring transparency and accountability in surveillance. I'm doing this research uh, now and it is a very, um, interesting debate within the surveillance tactics and measures used and how we could be more transparent and accountable in accordance with the privacy impact assessments. How do you do a privacy impact assessment when you're doing surveillance? But nevertheless, we uh, are not in a position for, you know, for some time now, let's say, to do a specific policies within the sectors because even within the sector there are uh, challenges and there are differences. So I have started to, to work like a roadmap for businesses, but again, it is a huge map mapping process on how do we do things and how we should do things. Thank you, thank you very much, Liliana. Let's. Uh, you've, you've raised. Uh, yeah, yeah. We, you've raised very important uh, issues, and um, uh, you gave already a very comprehensive uh, and detailed uh, response on on the issues that we have raised before. So maybe then I would I would change to another question. Actually, I think it's very interesting uh, that the way you see this balance between the economy and the the, the, the fact that the businesses have to uh, um, you know work a lot on on specificities each sector. Um, maybe I go back to Jenna's point on this, uh, because what we're talking here, it's not only a specific implementation for the sector of telecoms of the GPR, it's really a new law that is going to uh, actually, this is now being discussed at the EU level uh, for, uh, for um, telecom, uh, well, not really telecom operators, but also because of... Um, um, communication services in general. Uh, as, as we know, there's another uh, directive I don't know if, 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 if people are aware, but there's another directive for telecoms today only, which establishes something that the other sectors are, are not subject to, which is the confidentiality of communications. So the content of the communications cannot be revealed by the operators unless they get an, a, a, an order from the court. Um, and there are some special r rules also for the processing of data. And this is, this is the directive that is being updated now. So it's a parallel instrument to the GDPR. And the difference there is that, uh, well, the GDPR have different grounds for processing. So businesses can be processed on the base of consent, on the base of performance of contract, on the base of their legitimate interests, because they are providing a service online. Uh, for communication services, the proposals that are being discussed now in the European Union is to have a consent only rule. Um, so actually, I think one of the questions that I would like to launch a debate as well is, is consent actually uh, the, the, the best solution? And um, do you think, Janet, that the, the users are better protected with the consent as a ground for protection? Uh, and if, if, if this special treatment of communication services is, is justified in this sense? Thank you, Marta. Uh, that's why I spare time in my presentation to talk a lot about the internal procedures that we are preparing now not only in Vivacom, but in all telecommunications sector and probably in all big companies 
like utility companies, financial sector, and etc., just to emphasize that this is the role of the industry uh, to prepare itself internally uh, to protect the data of consumer. Because if we rely, if we trusted this responsibility to a consumer saying, okay, if you give me a consent, I will do anything that I have with your data, I believe that this is not a responsible approach, to be honest. We talked a lot last night with many of you and also this morning that we all are bombarded now with the privacy notice. Do you want to stay with me? Click yes, click yes, click yes. How many of you have made already so many clicks without knowing, even without read, what is written in there? Uh, and sometimes if some of you uh, spare time to read uh, the privacy notices and procedure, they're saying, I cannot understand almost anything. Uh, so that's why I believe that this process of voluntary certification, a third party quality stamp, will give, us, uh, will give our customers additional confidence to stay with us. Uh, as far as concern, consent is concerned, because this is the main differentiation between horizontal legislation of GDPR and the draft legislation of e-privacy, I don't believe that consent is the... Uh, answer of everything. Uh, and I don't believe that we do need a special tailor-made legislation just for the telecom sector, uh, because GDPR gives enough guarantees uh, for um, a stable and legitimate data processing of our customers. Uh, E-privacy, let me, let me give a very, very simple example that came up to my mind uh, yesterday when I paid some bill for food at the airport. Uh, I paid with my visa and I said, okay, right now, visa knows very well where I am, what I'm buying, and what the exact amount I have spent already. Visa will need to process this my data only using GDPR. Meanwhile, why the telecom operator may process the same data, like a location data, uh, asking for specific consent by a consumer. On my personal view, the consent needs to be asked only and when uh, an operator or a company wants to provide the data to a third party. Then, of course, for their own needs, consent of consumer should be collected. But for our internal purposes, like profiling customers, like providing them specific services, because what have Visa done with me, probably they, they profiled me and they offered me uh, years ago uh, a high class credit card and priority pass for business lunch to the airport, which means that they know they, that I travel a lot and they know that I spent Maybe not a lot, but enough for them to offer me this product. I, I do not disagree with this. I'm fine with this because it serves me. So this should be the same with the telecom company. And as I said uh, in my presentation, I don't think that the telecom company's innovation policy uh, and um, a policy of putting a lot of money for in infrastructure should be impeded by some sector-specific legislation. Thank you, Janet. Uh, Liliana, would you like to briefly comment on that? But just brief, because then we need to go to the audience for, for questions. But if you would like to comment on this issue of consent and sector-specific legislation. Yeah, yes, of course. Um, I don't think this is the best example about you know, the passengers' uh, flight information since there is a specific um, passenger name record directive that was issued a couple of um, year and a half ago. So basically, it's, it's a, already a sector-based legislation that refers to the passenger name records and flights and everything and the data they're collecting and why they, they are collecting. It was basically the grounds for adopting it was the, the counter-terrorism issues and national security. But nevertheless... This is credit um, card. Sorry, sorry, Liliana. This was a credit card. Um, what we receive here is a, a huge amount of, of metadata, which are, you know, even a part of the metadata are actually not could, could not be part with uh, given with the consent. So those are the data that are actually uh, executed or withdrawn 
I mean, you cannot uh, specifically say whatever it is in, into the data that you're collecting, or it, maybe it's a product of data sets that you're collecting. Perhaps, do we need to inform the customers about, you know, not only the, the location of where you are, not only the, the persons who, whom you have talked with, but basically, the, the product will be what was the Cambridge Analytica model, uh, the case, as you know, the previous period mentioned, is basically the combination um, of these two data sets is basically the privacy issue, where you are, with whom you talk, and you know, the, these are the, the privacy concerns, not only the, the data sets themselves. So the consent could be withdrawn. I can give you the consent today, and I could I could withdraw it tomorrow. So it means a lot of burden in the processes of uh, in each and every organization. So this consent actually could should be uh, um, um, seen as a as a tool, but basically as a risk. Why? Because it's a huge risk whenever you have to, you know, not let's say daily on a daily basis, but you need to in, in, um, implement um, a regular checks whether this consent could be applied for each and every operation, each and every procession of, of data. So basically, I could give you an, a consent for one uh, data set that you can process, but again, I will not give you a consent to combine these data. So uh, it's not only a paper that you're going to sign, as we have seen a lot of um, you know, examples, uh, specifically in Macedonia, when working with data protection agency, what they do is basically having um, one A4 format a blank paper that you are signing that you're giving consent. No, it's an you know opt-in uh, opt opt-out procedure that uh, data protection officers for the time being or personnel engaged for this um, procedure should be revising each and every time and controlling. That is why we need regular and um, periodical reviews of these uh, consent uh, that are signed by the, the data subject rights. It would be a huge technological, first of all, um, issue and, of course, a risk to, them, um, to the controllers, whatever sector they, they are coming from, uh, to provide and to assure a written as it said in the GDPR, it said, you know, the syntax is written consent. So how we provide an online written consent and which IT tools could be proven even further in the court proceedings if I say that I haven't signed this and I haven't agreed upon this. Okay. Um, okay. We, yeah, we need kind of more discussion, more detailed discussions within sectors. And if I may propose that CDIC as a platform could, you know, uh, join us a little bit much more in, and divide us into, into the, the, the sector based uh, where we're coming from and where we could add more values basically in different sectors and mm -hmm. to see, to map the challenges we have in different sectors. And then we could approach uh, upon building and writing down the policy papers for a specific uh, sector. Thanks a lot, Liliana. That's a very good suggestion. Uh, now we, we are getting a bit short of time, but we really would like to turn to the audience and ask you what are your views on this. Uh, maybe uh, I would leave that up to, to Christina to actually make the liaison with the office. Yeah. The audience, go ahead. Um, so uh, we've been talking to the audience the past days about this, and we actually spoke to two persons who, who uh, have some views on this. I would like to go to Arvin first, if if you would like to share some views with us, because uh, here we've been discussing the problems of, for example, giving consent and the pros and cons of that. And uh, you're an expert on blockchain. And blockchain is uh, a technology that can be used to ensure data protection. So maybe you can explain a bit to us uh, how that could be an alternative to what we've heard here. Sure. Thanks, Christina. Thanks to the panel. And, uh, I'm Arvin Kimberry from Diplo, and uh, as Christina mentioned, I was involved in uh, blockchain development and from from the beginning. And uh, first of all, I would like to kind of touch on how the blockchain and GDPR are actually compliant. Can they be compliant? Is this um, a show killer for blockchains, GDPR, or, or something like that? Well, first of all, I would like to point out that in GDPR there is one 
uh, one word which is actually 14, 15 times in a GDPR, which says erasing your data. Even though this is not actually uh, clear how that means, what that means, uh, blockchain and cryptographic solution actually works on a, on a, different, on a different level. We can say that one blockchain can have some private data encrypted and then we can lose that key and uh, deliberately delete it, burn it, and lost it, and that data wouldn't be accessible. But this is not erasing your data. So this is specifically uh, said in GDPR, this is not the raising of that. If there is any possible, even hypothetical way that that data can be restored from that private key we destroyed, uh, this is not erasing. So this is an ontology question, actually, how do you erase those data? Like, how do you remove it? And what actually erasing data means, especially private data? On the second hand, what just the remote uh, participant just said, it's, uh, on, it's basically on this consent, how often you can give a, your written consent and is it for every notice of, of blockchain, etc. So uh, blockchain are devised to be a uh, solution from centralized uh, places where we store all of data, kind of Facebook data centers and things we just start bashing here. And uh, the idea was that the individual can provide a specific data to the, uh, to the person outside who's actually asking for it and deliver only that data, nothing else. No other metadata as, as mentioned or, or whatever, but just the specific data to a provider in order to have this kind of, a, this kind of a, um, experience which was described, uh, described by uh, airport and buying, etc. So, the industry can work on that, actually can have a data which is needed for that very moment, but only that data, not other related data, like when you give you an email, everyone else will know what else is that with your email, your Gmail account or whatever else uh, data you have. What, when, with the blockchains, you can actually have just a small amount of data and pass it to the someone who will, uh, who will consensually pass it to the someone who can uh, further make it in any way monetize or whatever. The, the one more interesting thing about GDPR and, and blockchain, of course, uh, is that they can coexist. Uh, not all data in a blockchain should be and can be, uh, or can be uh, encrypted. Uh, the blockchain can be an anchor to a data which is off-chain and refer to a blockchain for uh, immutability and trust. But uh, again, it's, it's on uh, off-chain, so can it be physically deleted or whatever. And on the, on the la as a last point, we need to uh, consider blockchain, we need to kind of make a distinction between open blockchain and permission blockchain, which is a closed uh, government, uh, agency or company govern the blockchains, which are of course uh, complied by GDPR, but we know who they are, the, where they store their data, who their nodes are, so they're fully compliant with GDPR. The second part, open blockchains are, are not. Are, uh, everyone can be a node, so in a GDPR sense, everyone can be a data processor. So it's gonna be a bit, um, a bit harder for the open blockchains in the GDPR era, but again, there are solutions like uh, attaching data to a blockchain, but not putting it into a blockchain, but using a blockchain as a, a confirmation a confirmation string. Uh, that's one point from. Uh, I think we have uh, another view here from the audience on blockchain. Perhaps. No. Uh, not on blockchain. On I have a question about GDPR. Okay, so my name is Jan Jorge. I'm coming from a technical community. And as a NOG organizer, Network Operators Group organizer, now I'm going through all this pain on trying to understand how to implement GDPR on all our mailing lists and all this stuff. We are kind of going through and trying to understand what to do. Uh, but then I was thinking a little bit further. If, if we don't have an explicit consent to store the data, right? So if somebody calls me on my phone and that 
I get the, 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 the phone number, right? And if I put this phone number in my address book on my phone and give it a name, and of course, sync it to Google because you know everything goes to Google, um, and then I keep collecting this data in my phone, does that mean that now with G G GDPR I need to delete my, my phone book? Because I never got an explicit consent that I can store this data. Or with, the, with, with emails. If somebody sends me an email and I reply to this email, my, my Thunderbird mail, cli mail client stores that email address into my address book. And that person never gave me a consent for that. So should we just delete all the phone books and, and address books now? Or what should we do? Thank you. OK, thank you very much. Perhaps uh, we can leave that question to our two panelists to answer. Uh, yep. Uh, let me, I will start with um, uh, the technical specialist. Uh, I'm sorry, I <laughs> didn't get your name. Uh, yes, there are so many questions. How are we going to implement GDPR? Uh, but that's why I believe that GDPR is an evolution. We have already done this. We have answers to emails. We have collected uh, phone numbers to, to all of our friends and professional contacts without jeopardizing and without going into the breach of the legislation. And I believe that for you to collect uh, the phone numbers of your friends will not be uh, a GDPR violation. As well as, because many, I'm a lawyer as a profession, uh, and many of my friends are asking me, okay, if I go to a conference and people gave me their business card, then do, do I have a right to send them some kind of information for my researches, for example, or the books that are making on the subject, or I should first send them email asking, may I send you an email with my books, for example? <laughs> so this is some kind of very, very, um, how to say, and very conservative, let's say, approach to the GDPR. Because real life, uh, should yeah. GDPR should serve to real life, not vice versa. But I'm very interesting. Did you want to say something? Because I had a question in the same way. I know, no, go, go, no, I was just uh, because I, I, I heard that Lee Eliana wants to comment, and I was wondering if she could uh, briefly explain us uh, that the GDPR does not require consent for everything. So you can process data on other grounds, uh, correct? Would you like to explain us that better, Liliana? Briefly. Uh, yes, I would like to use those um, colored um, cards that w you previously exercised with, with the questions. So I would pose a question to the public as well. Do you think that the credit card's number are personal data? It seems that we have a lot of greens here, so people seem to believe that uh, credit card numbers are personal data. Well, they're not. They're not personal data, but the PIN number is personal data. So let's, I mean, um, let's not over complex is this as it is complex enough. So basically the mail and the phone number, it depends on the context and depends on the usage of the data and where you're going to use it and for what purposes. So basically, what was mentioned before, can I mail you something? It's um, under the issue of the provision of the direct marketing. So basically, if we are not sure, we should look upon the provision of uh, what is direct marketing and what kind of information I can send you there and which type data I, I can use, your data I can use uh, for it. But basically, what the GDPR? The GDPR is mostly asking questions to ourselves. The questions you asked me, is I'm sure that you're going to answer them um, excellent, not you know, not waiting for the answers from the expert. Why? Because the questions uh, when I work with the with the SMEs on bringing the GDPR into their organization is what I do is mostly ask questions. For example, where is the data? Where is the, what is the, what are the categories of the personal data you are processing when you are I don't know in the blockchain? Um, discussion or when you are in a simple 
um, control on, let's say, uh, collection of data. What are the data? Actually, where are the data located? Are they located in the EU? Are they located <laughs> uh, US? Are they located in, in other country? For example, you can have a controller established in the EU country, um, EU member country, and then you can have the services customers from the US. But basically, the data are located somewhere in the cloud, which is again um, controlled by uh, countries, I don't know, from India. So um, it's it's a very complex issue, and mm -hmm. but you know step by step answering the questions of how do you track the access? Do you have any proof how to track access? How to track the transfer of data? And, and basically, can you prove somehow the erasure um, the erasure of, of data? Uh, what do you mean by correction or deletion in more specific terms? So basically, the, the definitions are very broadly. Uh, yes. explained in the GDPR and I'm sure that you can within the definition of the procession you can somehow prove your process within the, the processing the procession of, of data. Um, how do you protect your data is how do you report actually to your customers and how do you inform them um, about the, the incidents how how the encryption done um, how do you prove that? Is there shared access to data? Is there the storage is on cloud or somewhere behind? Um, what is the risk of automating the, the process itself? So basically, uh, the impact you will feel is when you are starting to answer the questions yourself. It's not always the erasure of data, the, the problem itself as in, in according to the definition but in according to the processes that are within the organization or how it is done. If you're able to prove that this is uh, the erasure, that this is how you actually have done the, the erasure of personal data, that is the most important thing. That, that's why I mentioned previously the court proceedings. We need to assure within and to, you know, to, to have it very much assured not only the written consent, but the proof of it. Okay, thank you, Liliana. The written consent. That the action. Can you prove that it was given for a specific uh, data, for a specific time, for a specific uh, obligation, and for a specific purpose of procession. Okay. So basically, there are you know a couple of factors whether you know uh, you can have a written consent, but you are not processing the personal data on a fairly manner, on a transparent manner, and you're not processing the data as in accordance with with the principles of the accountability and informing the data subject. So basically, the consent you're having, it's not backed up, you know. It's it's not the technology. Liliana, thank, thank you very much for, for the clarifications. We need to go back to, to the audience. Uh, I think uh, Mar Arvin already had his qu uh, uh, answer on the erasure. Um, and uh, well, not so much on the grounds, but Janet, you had something more for Arvin, and yeah, then we need I, to to go back to the audience just a, very just briefly. Just a very please. very brief comment because you spoke uh, for this new right of the consumer for data uh, portability, uh, which is actually portability is not in new for the telecom sector because we are doing number portability even now. You know very well as our customers, I mean the telecom companies, that you may transfer your phone number in 24 hours from one company to another when you cancel the contract. Uh, this, this uh, more or less, this will be done with the data that you have provided to one of the provider. Then you will be able to transfer this data to the new provider. Our belief of, in the telecom sector is this, that this might be done only when you terminate the contract with the previous provider. But uh, the explanation of Erwin on uh, blockchain imposed to me a question, could we, for example, use the blockchain technology in this process of uh, uh, data portability to make it easier when we have a request for a customer for data portability? That's for sure, and it's already, I think, done from, for some telecoms. I think they are already exploring this portability. Is a, is a, a, issue which is addressed by blockchains. 
And again, when um, it said that it's not about how easy to raise the, or we need an accountable process to follow it, but it is about a raising in GDPR. They're actually just not... Um, throwing away encrypted keys was not enough for EU regulation. They said that you need to erase it. Just erasure is mentioned many, many times. And again, there is the, uh, Article 17, I think, it's right for be forgotten, or it's 15. So, uh, a right for be forgotten actually means um, a changing information or even putting it even back. But it says under the what's the definition under the technical uh, under the technical scope. So, if it's way too complicated to do it, it's kind of don't do it. But what kind of right to be forgotten, it, as I said, it's a right. But again, it's not a problem for blockchains. You can, um, you can just encrypt the headers of a block, so don't, don't need to encrypt the entire data in it. And, but then again, we are the, uh, the, um, uh, the question, are the blockchain open for everyone or private uh, permission-based blockchain? But in answer for your question, yes. It can be done, and it's discussed uh, under the telcos. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Arvind, so much for your explanation of blockchain for us uh, non-technical people, how it works. Uh, we will take questions from the audience soon. But first, I would like to hand the mic to Adela Alexandru, who was also participating in the youth school where I learned you had a lot of discussions about the Cambridge Analytica scandal. And of course, all of that relates to this. How can we empower users to be in control of their data? And, and um, what are the understanding of uh, the new rules from a user side? So please share our views, uh, your views with us. Thank you for giving me the floor. <laughs> I am a student of political sciences in Romania and also an activist for human rights. And just listening to the panel, I was thinking that it's so confusing uh, even for the people working in the field to understand the actual requirements of the GDPR. And it's so hard, like if you do not have the clarifications, then how will you implement this? So I think that talking about transparentization, it has to be involving many actors, like not only the people working in the field and um, implementing the GDPR, but also the users, because we need to know more things um, about how you will do the implementation, what my consent means actually, how am I able to give you my consent? If you are erasing my data, how will this be done? So. There are a lot of things needed to be discussed from the user side as well. Um, uh, actually, during the youth school, um, an interesting pattern that I have seen is that we are coming from the academia field or maybe civil society, but not at this big level. Um, and actually, in the day zero, we discussed some idea that were actually then de um, developed here during the panels. So this means that we have some links in, in the knowledge, but we need to share more. And I think that the awareness um, bullet point that was mentioned many, many times, it's maybe the most important. And I think that uh, raising awareness, uh, we can do this through education. But education has to, to tackle the lack of uh, information. This is just my opinion. And yeah. Uh, Thank you very much. Maybe we collect uh, some yeah, questions. We have only two minutes, I think. But um, if we are not too hungry, maybe we can like, take one or two questions more. I think there was a question <laughs> here in the back, which uh, we could hand over to the panel before we have final comments and then lunch wrap up. Yeah. Thank you. How to spoil uh, the party for uh, going for it? Vladimir uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Diplo, a quick, quick. Uh, question or concern, which you touched a little bit upon thus far with the raising data, uh, now beyond blockchain, one of my concerns is actually the implementation, the enforcement. Uh, and it, it boils down to, to removing data. What is the way uh, to actually make sure that the data are removed, uh, erased? How can we make sure that, how can agencies be sure that uh, private sector or whoever of the institutions have actually removed the data, they're not storing it somewhere else, that they can't recover it, and so on. And I think enforcement will be a huge, huge issue when it comes to GDPR. Thanks. Okay, so I guess that was a little yeah. bit more of a comment. Okay. 
than a question, but I'll hand over to Marta <laughs> for final words and wrap up, and of course Thank our uh, rapporteurs. Nobody wants to listen to me, so I would. Uh, <laughs> I was going to. I'm going to ask uh, Liliana if in one minute you can actually. Uh, make a final a final comment, then I will ask Janet the same thing, and then I will ask our rapporteurs to, to the conclusions. One minute, please. In one minute, Article 17 of the GDPR explains the positions when and where actually the erasure of data could be done and why. Uh, basically, we should um, assure the awareness level much more, not only to the citizens, but the persons involved in uh, working in the in controllers and working on the erasure. Uh, we could always ask the controller whether our data has been erased, but that means that we are asking them whether the, the purpose of uh, processing the data is already uh, done, and whether the, the deadline for processing is already over, and whether there is a not legal obligation by a third party or national defense strategy or whatever. So basically, the requirements are set, set in Article 17. Um, it would be, I'm very, you know, uh, sorry to hear that um, nothing is clear yet. Uh, I think that we are in, in the process of clearing the, the paths much more than we were in uh, one year ago. But nevertheless, um, you know, nothing much more happens from tomorrow. It's it still seems, uh, stays. Um, maybe the same or maybe just one step further of acknowledgement that the GDPR is much more of data subject rights. You should always think about how you're processing the data, the data in, uh, in relation to um, the data subject rights. That would be my last point. Thank you very much, Liliana. Janet, this is not going to be done overnight, <laughs> right? Yeah, I very much agree with you. I will be very, very quick so as not to put you away from your lunch, saying that, yes, GDPR will be a process. This will not be done overnight. And discussions like this, uh, compliments to the organizers, because this was a very timely discussion uh, at the eve of the uh, enforcement of GDPR. Discussions like this will help all the stakeholders, like company, um, governments, customers, to talk about, to create a culture on data protection, and afterwards to finalize the discussion with a very balanced approach, with an optimistic approach, what kind of opportunities uh, gives us uh, GDPR and data protection uh, legislation. And for me, the key word is trust. Thanks a lot, uh, Janet. Uh, so, uh, Nika, Jana, can I uh, ask uh, your help to wrap up? Hi. Um, so, the first key message is regulation and implementation are a process. Current data protection regime is broad and enriched, and from now on, we should not focus on that but on the privacy of the personal data we're collecting, processing, and sharing. Okay. And the second key message is data protection is an opportunity for a data driven economy. GDPR is an instrument to enhance the trust of users, to legitimize data processing and third-party audits could be a potential approach to securing full implementation of the GDPR. Yes, okay. And the third one is the civil society sector should do more to raise awareness and build capacities internally in the data processing organizations and among data subjects on how their personal data is being collected, processed, and shared. No objections. And then the fourth one, questions of consent and notification about breaches are important. There is a need for deciding when and how should data subjects be informed about data breaches and about the continuous revision of data protection. Yeah, okay. Okay, thank you very much. GDPR enters into force tomorrow, so we all are very well prepared to go ahead. Thanks a lot, Liliana. Thanks a lot for joining, Janet. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Short enough.